Good morning. Uh, let's see if this microphone works. All right. Good morning. It's a blessing to see everybody here this morning. Thank you for giving this time to the Lord and letting Him use it to speak to your hearts and uh, enrich your lives and use and hopefully use this opportunity to be a blessing to others. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing this morning. Chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. We'll get these up here on the, on the wall. Here. Is that going to happen, Andy? Are we having? Were you supposed to memorize it? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's read together. I'll get it started. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these words of the first and the last who died 
who came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Lord, bless the reading. Let's pray together. Lord, we just pray this morning that the fine weather and the rocks that may come to your place here and the fellowship with one another. We hear your word, Lord, and uh, we pray for blessing from that word. Father, we ask that you would ask that you give us the word, uh, that uh, you will uh, receive impressions from our holy hearts and uh, just. Uh, be with us through this service and the rest of the community be with you. Amen. God bless. You're already seated. Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to uh, share communion together, celebrate the body and the blood of the Lord. This will be the first Sunday of the month. We have open communion here at Lakeview. That means that you are a believer, we encourage you to participate. And what we normally do is we serve everyone, and then once everybody has been served, we can partake together. So I'm going to turn the uh, microphone here over to Colson, and we'll go from there. Good morning. Good morning. Um, brothers, you meet separate people. same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if you were more discerning with regard to yourselves, but if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So verses 23 to 26 are very commonly read for communion. They are an excellent summary of well, why we do communion and what it symbolizes. But 27 to 31 2 are pretty often left out because they are kind of a gloomier side of the passage. So I like that got me rather confused the first time I read it, because on first or on the surface level, it sounds like if we do something wrong when doing communion, we fall under the judgment of God. But that kind of misses the fundamental point. To be sure, communion shouldn't be entered into flippantly. But Paul's point in this section is that communion is an act of unity for the believer. Earlier in the book, Paul uses communion as an example of unity. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14-17, he writes, Therefore, dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? It is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one in body. For we all partake of the one loaf. Here Paul is urging the Corinthian church to flee from idolatry. And after this, he states that those who participate in the pagan feasts are participants in the idolatry of the pagans. His point is that just as communion is an act of Christian unity, so idolatrous practices are an act of pagan unity. So, earlier in this very chapter, Paul rebukes the Corinthians for their lack of unity in regard to the Lord's Supper. In 11, 17 through 22, he criticizes them for how one of them gets drunk while the other one starves and goes without. He's stating that the Corinthian division is making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. And in participating in what is supposed to be an act of Christian unity, they are only demonstrating the deep divisions that are between them. Paul's point is that we are one body, Christ's body. And the act of communion reminds us, reminds us of that which binds us together, the death of Christ. We don't need to make ourselves worthy of partaking in the Lord's Supper. The reason we are united in it is because we are all unworthy of it. We are all in sin. None of us is naturally more holy than any other, which is why as often as we eat and drink of the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death and the reason for his death, our, and our need for his sacrifice until his return. We all have differences, but in Christ we are one body. So let us partake of the elements as one body. Sovereign Lord, thank you that you saved such an unworthy people, that you have taken us out of darkness and chosen us for yourself, that you have washed us clean of our blemishes and stains and made us one in you. May we be unified as your body and be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. In your great name, I pray. Amen. Well, good morning again. You have your Bibles? Yes. Why don't you open them someplace? How about how about Ruth? Alright. So let's open our Bibles to the book of Ruth. I want to talk to you this morning about the skin you're in. Hopefully that will make sense by the time we're done. If not, please don't tell me because it'll just discourage me all afternoon. <laughs> We've heard the phrase, he was comfortable in his own skin. You know, I marvel at this point. Uh, and I, I'm so pleased that we're on a program 
wasn't our idea, but where we read this over and over again. Because, you know, in, in a year, when you read some of these passages again, you won't be the same person. And God is the same, but we're constantly changing and adjustments making in our lives and we think about things differently and we learn things. And God's grace is so good that he continually shows himself anew. If we'll just stay faithful. I, and I, I don't... You know, I've heard folks say they got boring. I, I'm sure that it's possible. I want to, you know, be cautious on that. Obviously, we can get into a place where we become stagnant, perhaps, when that's that's actually a, a clue that something is wrong. But uh, God's. I also want to thank you for your questions. And there may be some questions today because there are things in here that I know that I read that I got questions. And I, as I was uh, thinking about that, I thought, you know, I, I read this extra carefully because there are some of you who like to ask questions. And I'm thinking, uh, they're going to ask me about that. I better know what it means. Uh, so your asking questions causes me to read differently. I would challenge you to read some of this as if you had to teach it. It will change the way you look at it. Um, so now if you don't, if you read this this week and you don't have any questions, that's wonderful. Don't go look at them up now. Okay? Don't go trying to find something now if that kind of thing happens. Uh, kind of serendipitously, we don't need to make it happen. Let me read to you some verses out of this wonderful book. What a wonderful book. And we read, and we talked about it last week, we read through the book of Judges and all of the terrible things that went on in those books, or in that book, and, and during that long period of time, and uh, the wickedness that was there, and the people's continuous, uh, continually failing. And, and then we said that Ruth was in that time. So, in that time where all that other stuff was going on, we have this wonderful book that's, that's a story that's so full of hope and faith. And, you know, we're only human. We, we see someone that we like or we look up to and they say the wrong thing, they do the wrong thing, we see them fail and it's, it, it discourages us. Sometimes we have to go to the Lord to say, Lord, what's going on? You know, help us and, 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 and seek God. For, for wisdom in the whole thing. At the same time, we see someone who's who's doing it right, and we get we get encouraged. And we got a whole bunch of people here doing things right. So let's let me read to you some verses, and these are just highlights. And I'm jumping right through the book from first chapter to the end of the book to just to read some things. So I want to make sure we don't miss verse 16, chapter one. But Ruth said, "Do not urge me to leave you." or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also if anything but death parts me won't take a lot of time on any of these scriptures, but I just wanted to read that out because it's one of the most, actually one of the most beautiful things in all of literature. <clears throat> anything you can read, whether Shakespeare or the Greek classics, you're not going to read anything with higher sentiment of love and devotion. And actually, um, the phraseology of it is just, is just wonderful. It's also an expression of faith. Your God shall be my God. And then she continues it a little further and says, if I don't do this, then may the Lord hold me accountable. So it's actually an expression of her faith and trust in the, in the Lord Jehovah. Chapter 2, verse 3. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. 
And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. So it's a short verse. <clears throat> Doesn't, it may not be significant to you, but I encourage you if you mark in your Bibles to mark the little phrase, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. She happened. Chapter 2, verse 11. Um, but Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and your native lamb and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come. To Boaz is... Um, recounting to Ruth of how he knew what she had done and his blessing to her, uh, covering her with, with blessing, so putting a blessing on her and on her life. Chapter 3, verse 10. Um, and again, I'm, I'm reading all of these out of the context of the part of the, the narrative or the story they're in, so I hope you can follow along. At this point, I maybe give a background to this. Ruth has come to the threshing floor and, and laid at the feet of Boaz. And when he says, what are you doing here? She says, uh, spread your wings over me, for you're my redeemer, etc." cetera. Uh, read all that. But basically what she was doing was proposing marriage. Very interesting concept. She was basically saying, why don't you marry me? Now, I don't suggest that's the way you do it. I mean, there ought to be some formality at least connected with a marriage proposal. And usually it comes from the man, not from the woman. And uh, I don't suppose, guys, that if you do it, you know, you, you just kind of offhand and say, you know, why don't we get married? That's kind of, I suggest you put a little more romanticism involved in it. But basically, she's... she's uh, asked him to marry her. And so here's what he said. Uh, verse 10, he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. So the last kindness was her saying, you know, uh, it would be good if we if you married you. First kindness is what she did to her mother in law So, just interesting verse, and once again, it's back to the character of, uh, of this woman. And, uh, and then we'll just close with this. Um, let's see, let's look at verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name. This is the, this is the baby of Ruth, the grandson of Naomi. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So we now see that this child is in the genealogy of David, the king, and further in the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. If you read the genealogy in Matthew, uh, you'll find out that Boaz was the son of Rahab. So there's some interesting things that are going on here with God including people, not because of blood, but because of promise and because of grace. It's faith that connected them to the grace that God offered, and their, that faith and that grace pulled them into the promise. All right, so let me talk to you about Ruth. I gave you some highlight verses there, and uh, it's an interesting story. It was written, as we mentioned earlier, during the time of Judges. The writer is unknown. We don't know who wrote it. But it was written after the time of David. Otherwise, David 
couldn't be mentioned. So we got this whole genealogy here. Uh, there are three central characters, and two of them are women. Naomi and Ruth, and of course, the third central character is Boaz. This book <clears throat> is written from a woman's perspective. And every, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, each of the sources that I um, referenced brought that out. They thought, they, uh, they all thought that was an interesting thing. It's not only told from a woman's perspective, it actually shows kind of how life was for women in, in that day and age. But it, it shows what their world was like. Um, there are contrasts in here, and I won't take time to give you the references to all of them, but there are uh, contrasts. It actually uh, highlights con contrasts. So if you read it carefully, you'll find out that living and dead are contrasted. You'll find out that uh, it, it mentions finding and seeking rest. So find and seek, you got this different. And, and pleasant and bitter. So, folks, we, 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 uh, we, we don't appreciate pleasant unless perhaps we've experienced bitter. So, you know, those things are full and empty are also contrasted there. And uh, also, I just read the verse, last and first kindness. And basically, it probably should be this latest kindness that I've ever gave up being kind after that. There's also found in this book a, a, a reversal motif where things are turned around. So uh, uh, the needy get fed and the barren become fruitful and that sort of thing is going on. It is a story of redemption. It's also a story of faithfulness, integrity, love, and faith. I already mentioned one of the verses about faith. Most of all, it's a story of God's faithful provision. How God provided for everyone. You know, the Lord, through this, provided for us. One, he provided this wonderful story. It's not only got moral lessons in it, which of course we, want, we don't want to dismiss. We just want to make sure that we, as we read this, we don't make moral lessons the main point, because the main point is not how we're to be a nice person faithful and loyal. The point is that we're to trust in God's provision. This book is a story about the Lord God. It, there are things in it for us to learn how to live, but the main story is God revealing himself, and he reveals himself as a provider in this, and as a redeemer. We'll look at that. So, it's not just a moral lesson, it's a story, and it's also a story of how God uses people to meet other people's needs, and to further his plan. And sometimes the people furthered his plans whether, whether they were aware of it or not. I don't know about you, but that gives me lots of hope. Um, I don't want to get sidetracked. I maybe mentioned it a few weeks ago, but I've always been encouraged by the fact that God could use a donkey. <laughs> now that encouragement also carries with it a responsibility. You see that? If God could use a donkey, then, then never mind. You figure it out. <laughs> so, uh, the skin you're in. I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you today about the skin you're in. I want us to read some verses now. Put a marker or something here, or an offering on the little, or your finger, not chewing gum, but something like that. We're going to come back to this in a minute. But I want us to go to Second Timothy chapter one. We're going to read some New Testament passages, not just verses, but passages. And and each of these passages has uh, contains an overall theme. I, I won't be able to take a lot of time to talk on it, on, on them, uh, but I think they'll be, I think they'll be obvious. So, Second Timothy chapter one, if I can ever find it. First Timothy, I'm getting close, right? 
Second Timothy coming up. There it is. Second Timothy. Lots of notes. There we go. Chapter one, verse seven. Uh, verse, I'll read verse six. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Now we'll stop there. There's more that could be read, but I hope you see that there's a theme there. God, He's saying, look, God's got a purpose, and I'm involved in that purpose, and I'm trusting God to see that purpose through the end. And that was a very weak paraphrase, but kind of gives you the idea. Philippians, excuse me, Philippians chapter 1. We're back to it there. Verse 12. For I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So once again, back to this. He says, this thing that's happened to me, God's using to advance the gospel. It's the same Paul, by the way, who wrote to Timothy. Romans chapter 8, and once again, we're going to refer to the, no, excuse me, Ephesians 2. Go to Ephesians. Still Paul. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit is now and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. All right, so hang on here, and don't get distracted. Who's he writing about? <coughs> Who's he writing about? Pardon me? Okay. So we can disregard it? So I'm quiet in here. It's actually more quiet now than when I was reading. <laughs> right? No, it's all believers. Every believer was once dead and trespasses and sin. And because of that death, we lived our life <clears throat> under the control of the flesh and the devil. And we were by nature the children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So, I'll well, interrupt just a second, and we're going to continue reading here just a couple more verses. Now, he says, by his grace, he's raised us up, put us in heavenly places. Again, going real quickly, or paraphrasing this stuff. And he's using us, us, to show all of creation his wonderful grace. That means your life has a purpose right now beyond eating and drinking and gathering stuff. Your life has a purpose right now beyond being kind and gracious to your neighbor and being loving. And that may be part of it. But the purpose is larger than that. And, and oh, uh, let me continue reading. So, verse 8, by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. All right, the circle is almost complete. First he said you are dead, and then he said here's what God has done. Verse 4 said, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love, went on, and then we tells us what he's done to us and these wonderful things. And then he says, that isn't something that you've done, it's something that God has done. I'm here with you here so far. All right. So, so verse nine, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're his workmanship. He has done all of this. We haven't done it. He's done it. It's a gift of God. It's not our doing. And, and we're his workmanship. We're, we're the thing that he has made, and he has made us out of his, because of his love and because of his grace, he has made us so that he can be glorified in all of creation. Heavenly Father, I don't often stop and pray in the middle of what I'm trying to say, but I, I feel completely inadequate to communicate the grandeur and the glory of what we just read. And I pray that somehow, through your grace, because this is all your grace, that it would dawn on us the glory, glorious thing that you've done and the wonderful, unimaginable, awesome thing that you're doing in us. Deliver us from this mundane reality of this life and help us to see that all of that is just the condiment on the wonderful feast of all that you're doing. Pray in Jesus. Romans chapter 8. Verse 23. And again, I'm jumping in the middle here. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches 
hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he also foreknew, he also, excuse me, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things that God before us, who can be against us? I want to talk about the skin we're in. Get your in the skin I'm in. I read it. Uh, I read an interesting. Uh, I read a book about C.S. Lewis, and one of the things that was in it is they, they put some little excerpts in there of when he was. He did a lot of speaking, and he was called to go and talk to our Christian writers. Uh, I, I think I brought the book with me, but I didn't bring it out here. But uh, he was speaking to a group of young people who wanted to be Christian writers. And he said to them, you know what we really don't need is small books that are about Christianity. What we need are small books that are about other things that the Christianity is latent in them. Okay. Uh, and that's how he wrote it. And this book of Ruth has Christianity, has, Christianity, has godliness latent all through it. And uh, this this is one of my one of my texts. Uh, the book isn't actually this big, uh, although it is a big book. I didn't bring it, but I had to I had to really blow it up here to copy it so I could get it to print. And it's interesting because it it says that the Book of Ruth is criticized uh, because it. It has very little direct reference to spirituality. And then it goes on, and I'm going to, I'm going to just read this to you, uh, and you can find them. I'm not going to read the references. You can find them if you want to. It says, I think I've got seven incidents here. So let me just read what the incidents was. It's prayers for blessings include Naomi's plea, for Jehovah's kindness in providing husbands and security for Orpah and Ruth. So the testimony of the story, and that's what we're, that's what we're going on here, what I'm trying to communicate, the narrative of the story, Ruth says, look, let's pray for husbands. But, you know, I pray. Second one, Naomi's lament before the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite women that Jehovah had embittered her by bringing her back empty. So it's actually a, pr a prayer to, to the Lord and saying, look, ladies, don't call me Ruth, call me Mar Mara. Call me bitter. Because here's what God's done to me. And she's actually ref referring all this back to God. Number three, Boaz is blessing and prayer that Ruth will receive a reward from the Lord. Number four, Naomi blesses Boaz for his kindness. She didn't, by the way, she didn't bless him to his face. She, she blessed him before the Lord and before Ruth. Uh, Boaz blesses Ruth for seeking him out as a, as a redeemer, and we read part of that. The community later prays for the fruitfulness of the marriage, comparing Ruth to Rachel and Leah. And that's in the passages that you read. They said, may you be blessed like Rachel and Leah. So the, what, the, what are they doing? They're, they're, well, let me give you the last one here. And then it says the, the women of the community, by the way, did you think it was weird that the neighborhood lady's name was baby? Yeah. Did you, I mean, did you guys do that? They're not gonna, hey, I got a, I'm having a baby. Uh, you got an idea for a name? I mean, if, uh, I wish someone would come to my house because I have names. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, 
That'd be a unique child. All right, so here's the last one. The women acknowledge Yahweh's role or Jehovah's role in Naomi's restoration and praise Ruth for her part while praying for the fame of their prosperity. And it says that it ends, all these prayers have their outworking in the marriage of Ruth and Boaz and the birth of Obed. So why did I share that? Because there's very there's no preaching in this book. It's a story about these people's lives. And all through these people's lives, their, their trust in the Lord comes out. Even when it was a lament, God, why did you make me this? Why have you done this to me, God? Most Say this. this is, now, okay, you guys already, this is the hard part. <laughs> All of that was taking us somewhere. What, what are we looking at? We're looking to see that God has a purpose for our lives, that He's made us. Paul says, I'm fully persuaded that God's able to keep that which I've committed to Him. Paul was, Paul was comfortable in his own skin. I didn't, I didn't read the passage in Philippians. He said, I, he said I've, learned, I've learned the secret of how to be content, whether I've got a little or whether I've got a lot. In other words, his circumstances didn't bum him out of a lot. At least his circumstances, whether he was hungry or not, his circumstances didn't, didn't cause him to think that God's abandoned me or that I've done something wrong or God's disfavor is on me. He, he was content. Most, most modern Christians are always trying to add some little accoutrement into their life, some, some piece of, of spiritual jewelry that will make them look good to others and maybe make them look good to God. And it's a subtle and destructive form of works. And because of it, there's very little rest. No one rests, and no one is really themselves. These folks glorified God in their daily lives, and they and they and they rested in Him, and they were free from all the religious uh, ornamentation that too frequently defines modern Christianity. And secondly, or maybe finally, they needed no obvious organization to tell them what to do. They just lived out their life. Now, I'm going to give you a couple caveats to this, and, and then we'll come back to this and, and close. There is a time to speak boldly, plainly, and directly about God and His plan of redemption. There's a time to do that. Um, Not saying it shouldn't. Again, this is hard to communicate. I'm not sure that I'm doing a good job. God help me. But, uh, if you come and say you did something really well, I usually try to say thank you. And then I try to say something like God is good. I've made myself say something like God is good because I think it teaches and I think it's I think people expect it, although I don't need to say it because I know God is good. And if you come and say, that was a good sermon, preacher, and I say thank you, please know that I know that I didn't do it, that God did it. I, I hope that makes good sense. There's a time to say, well, anything good that came out of that, God did. And maybe we should say it more often than not. Let me talk about another topic. I sometimes don't pray before my meals. 
Does that mean I'm ungrateful? I had a college professor, and he was the strange guy in a lot of ways. But he introduced me to a novel concept. When they would bring the when they would bring the groceries home and put them on the shelves, he'd say, "Lord, we thank you for all this food." And that saved him time when he was hungry. <laughs> he'd say, well, "That's not spiritual." Who says? He's not your servant. You don't get to judge him. So, uh, there is a time to speak boldly and plainly about God and his plan of redemption. And there's times to articulate all this stuff. And by the way, <clears throat> they did articulate it. We read this book, they did articulate it. They were giving God glory for everything. Look what God's done for you. God's going to provide for you. God, uh, you know, made, and they prayed. May the Lord bless you and your offspring and so on and so on. So, and, and those were the, the seven incidents that I read where they always were always referring back in their daily conversation, referring back to the goodness of God. But it all flowed out of the natural flow of their life. There was nothing phony about it. There was, there was, there was nothing insincere about it. It came out of it. If it's not coming out of us, folks, something's wrong. If something else is coming out of us, something's wrong. The Holy Spirit that dwells, <clears throat> excuse me, the Holy Spirit that dwells in every believer's primary goal is to glorify the Son. And that brings me to my second point. <clears throat> Certainly there's a time to speak boldly and directly and blatantly about God and his plan of redemption. And the second thing is we just we can't be so comfortable that we don't continuously depend upon the Holy Spirit for our sanctification and correction. So at the same time, you may come and say, thank you, know, you may come and say, that was a good sermon, appreciate it, and I may say, thank you, and I may or may not say back to God. But the reason I do that is to keep them thinking that I did it. Because there are other times when the Lord said, you were kind of arrogant there, or you were proud. I remember many, many years ago, the people I was working for, I guess, my, my spiritual boss, so to speak, wanted me to meet with him. And after a church meeting, and I went and I, I waited for an hour because he met with all the people from the church. First, he had to meet with that person and that person and that person and that person and that person. And of course, those people all went to that church, and so they all gave me an office. I didn't go there. I was just called there. And by the time the hour was up, I was steaming. And I went in, I had the meeting. I had no idea what the meeting was about. It may have been important. I don't remember. But I do remember was going away angry and having the Lord say to me, you know, that hour was mine, not yours. Why are you upset about it? Okay. Don't be arrogant. So there's a time to speak boldly and directly and blatantly, you know, explicitly, not implicitly, and there's a lot of implicit implicitness in the book of Ruth, explicitly about God and his plan of salvation, and we must secondly continuously depend upon the Holy Spirit for our sanctification and correction. But at the same time, folks, we can be comfortable in our own skin. This thing that God has created us for, he's working in us. You say, well, what if I mess up? And then you're, you join the club. Because we all mess up. And what do you do? You confess. If it was before the Lord, you confess before the Lord. If it was to somebody else, you confess before the, to the Lord and to the other person for whom you, that, that you messed up. You go to both of them and you, and you, and you get it right. You take care of it. You say, well, is that how it's supposed to work? Yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. But we don't do very much confessing. I know we don't. We should. We'd stay humble then.
and we'd be real. Instead, we mess up and we say, well, it's real. Just like that cat that tried to jump. You've seen that video. That cat tried to jump, didn't make it, landed, and we just kind of said, I meant to do that. You know, and pat it away. And that's how we do sometimes. We're not, we're not real. We put on a spiritual ornamentation. Heavenly Father, stand with me if you would. I think we're going to sing next. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have done work of grace in our lives. We were once dead. We didn't understand any of these things. There was no way for us to understand. Our spirits were dead to you. We went our own way. We went the way of the devil. We went the way of the world. But just like the Apostle Paul who said he was apprehended, we were at some point apprehended by you. Changed us. Put, within, put your spirit within us. And now you're doing your good work in our lives for your great purpose. And just like sometimes the people in Ruth, we don't understand exactly how you're doing that or what all's happening, maybe what our role is in it. But we trust you. And Lord, as we read all this and think about all this, that's what it all comes down to. Do I try to look good because I don't trust what you're doing? Do I try to look good, make myself look good because that is this what we need? Do I rest in your grace? Do I trust you? Do I lean back in your arms that will never fail? And live a life of, of peace and joy. Not of strife and struggle, but of rest and confidence. Teach us the story of her. Previous days in your name. Would you stay standing with me? Go ahead and turn to hymn 179.
so very faithful. Uh, I know I got an email, but I didn't pay attention to it about the song. So. Nor would I have remembered this third verse that says, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy. Peace.